Before we take to the streets of Byzantium though, there is a short side quest line I'd like to do that I really feel is appropriate to put here. Back on the Groundbreaker, we got pointed towards looking for work at Sublight. They are a freelance smuggling and salvage operation, using the bureaucracy to mask their illegal operations. It actually makes sense why the board would keep a corporation like this around. Sublight are the system's scavengers. This means that despite how wasteful the main corporations really are, Sublight can pick their bones clean and return that waste back into the economy. Sublight is allowed to illegally operate on Monarch because it means that wealth can still be extracted from the planet. You lost a ship due to technical incompetence? Sublight will reclaim that ship, which keeps it out of marauder hands. Our first job with Sublight is to recover a large amount of industrial gas into our fuel tank. The secret though is that it's at Cascadia on Monarch. Where that gas would just collect dust sitting in an abandoned Rizzo's facility, Sublight's bringing that resource back to market, and the only risk was an independent spacer. Our next job is to take over an abandoned space station, and we're on to the final quest. Despite only being three parts, the Sublight line is still pretty fully formed. It makes for some great side content, really helps the world building, and feeds into the main plot line. Aliens. I'm talking about aliens. Oh. Oh. Okay. We can still salvage this. They, um, they're making a point about how smart people can fall victim to strange conspiracy theories, I guess. Okay, so this joke really isn't the worst thing, but our boss does want us to murder a woman in Byzantium. The punchline is that the woman is a regular scientist, and that Lilia drew obviously bad conclusions from the research facilities that we found previously. But uh, there's a problem here. Dr. Chartrand reveals the big mystery of the game, well before the point that the main quest does. This is a problem as this mission treats this somewhat like a joke. Later when we're supposed to have the big reveal, I thought the game was actually joking, which is obviously a mistake on my part as Outer Worlds lacks the sophistication of humor to perform such a long-running jest. You're then presented with a hard binary where neither choice actually matters that much. Well, kind of. Chartrand is a chimerist, which is a scientist who specializes in making Earth life compatible with Halcyon. She's not an alien, rather she's performing experiments to modify human life to become more compatible with the system as the food the colony is eating will not sustain us. And I'm going to copy the game here and pause. I'm sure you're expecting the inevitable 10 pages of discussion on this plot point, but it's completely out of sequence. The game has a whole cutscene prepared for this reveal, and Chartrand just spoiled it for us. And now I want you to relive the experience of finding out this information out of order like I had. It's a hard binary, but the consequences don't matter. You can spare Chartrand so she can go work with Phineas, but she doesn't, and she just disappears. Not even the omniscient ending narrator acknowledges what actually happened to her. You can get a promotion at Sublight for doing the deed, but other than a couple lines acknowledging the position in the DLC, that decision doesn't do much of anything either. Which is why Sublight is such an odd questline. In the original vision, Sublight was actually going to be part of the main quest after arriving on the Groundbreaker, and it was made optional due to complaints from lawful players. The very first iteration of that quest actually sent you directly to work with Lilia Hagen, who is the head of Sublight, the uh, Sublight Shipping and Salvage. Um, but we got a lot of feedback from people that they didn't like being forced to work directly with a criminal organization. They wanted the option of not doing that. I can't imagine the sequencing on how that was originally supposed to work, though. It is good that it tries to tie in a side story with the main plotline of the game. It's just out of sync with that line. It'd be better to refine its tone and material, but also gate each leg behind the main quest progression. We should not get the final part until after the point in the main story when the food crisis is already revealed. So instead, let's talk about skill checks. Outer Worlds uses them quite a bit. They're a handy tool in a game with a comprehensive skill system to give the player some agency in dialogue. I'm good with the medical skill, so I unlock dialogue related to being a doctor. But I do have some problems with how Outer Worlds handles it. I agree with Salt Factory's assessment that in any situation where a skill check is possible, that it's an overpowering temptation to select it. It does not matter if killing Sprats awards more experience than a level 1 skill check. I'll still prefer the level 1 skill check if I agree just enough with what's being said in the line, especially on Supernova difficulty. I once convinced a woman to return to civilization for experience, only to then shoot her for even more experience. I could have just killed 3 or 4 marauders for the same amount. New Vegas kind of had this problem, but Outer Worlds is worse for telling you that you've gained experience during the dialogue. Dopamine gained. Even then, skill checks in New Vegas were weighted somewhat equally with non-skill checks. 
They are alternative solutions based on the character you're playing, not always superior options. Outer Worlds also does things more arbitrarily than New Vegas. What level of skill check will be depends on where in the game you are, rather than how difficult that check should be. To give an example, a level 15 lie check might be convincing a kid that my disintegration ray is actually just teleporting people to another dimension, but it would be a level 100 lie check against an adult who has seen disintegration rays before. Rather, convincing people of things in Edgewater is just easier than other places because Edgewater is of a lower level. That makes some sense since people in Edgewater aren't well educated, sure, but some of them are specialists who would be very difficult to convince of a lie related to their field. It is gamified to make sure that the skill checks stay around the level that the average player could complete them. That's not a bad idea to start out with, but players should be sufficiently specialized by level 5 to not need these training wheels on throughout half the game. These are supposed to be role-playing opportunities, they really shouldn't be scaled to the player. But the biggest problem is that companions contribute to your skill rating. That sounds good, but the problem isn't that companions are unlocking additional dialogue options, but that because I have a doctor on my squad, I am better at medical checks. I enjoyed the very rare occasion where I was allowed to suggest using a crew member's skill set, usually Ellie's, rather than possessing complex technical information simply because they also were in the room. You gotta fight through or figure out some other way to exterminate them. Maybe the ventilation system? And will again. We ought to be taking any opportunity we get to bury those critters in lead. Direct and aggressive. I always did like your sensibilities. You know when to strike and when to wait. Shame what came of your crew. Crews are for ships. They were a family. Close enough. I've got an idea. Believe it or not, I'm trying to save our bullets. For once. I'll drop the O2 levels to 19.5%. That's still enough for humans, but the mantisaurs will die in a matter of minutes. Here goes. You also have the usual problem that RPGs with a focus on companions tend to have, which is incentivizing juggling companions to complete arbitrary skill checks. You can only have two at a time, and you don't know in advance what you'll need. Now, failure in RPGs, that can be cool, but I can also have Persuasion 150 if I call out Parvati and Felix for the dialogue. And I hope you don't think the supernova save rule is actually going to stop me from save scumming this stuff. I know that I am optimizing the fun out of my own game, and even the checks aren't terribly important. And yet I still found it annoying in a way that New Vegas never had a problem with. Even just reading back the conversations in my footage would annoy me. Like, there was a time where a terminal prompted me to have hack level of 55 to get inside it, and then immediately asked again for a hack level of 150. And it's not like I'm going through a gauntlet and have varying stages of success based on each check I can pass. There should have just been a single 150 check at the start, if that's the level that you thought should block it. So don't waste my time fetching the vicar just to find out that we still can't hack it yet. The game's sense of humor combos with its dialogue to create a nightmare experience, as though every person in your day-to-day -day life has been replaced with Redditors and Marvel characters, and then proceeds to make the game very dialogue-heavy. It's not a coincidence that I think the game's strongest sections in Monarch and Gorgon were also the parts that had the longest sections without dialogue. What I realized about the skill checks is that they're written in Outer Worlds with the assumption that players would prefer to pick them over regular dialogue, but in New Vegas they weren't. The resulting difference is that sometimes it feels like the only intelligent thing you can say in a conversation is gated behind some kind of requirement that it shouldn't be. That design difference probably stems from the response to New Vegas dialogue, and the general fetishism for skill checks and RPGs that would follow. Rather than treating checks as optional roleplaying, it seems to be viewed that you should be specialized in a dialogue, stealth, and tech skill of some kind, and use skill checks at least one third of the time that they're available, if not more. Basically, the fact that people liked them a lot in New Vegas led to attention being placed on them in the wrong places for Outer Worlds. Byzantium was a Greek city-state that was much later renamed to Nova Roma by a guy who, after he died, had the city renamed in his honor to Constantinople. Naming the city Byzantium in Outer Worlds seems to be a historical allusion with a degree of separation. The Americans are the Romans and Halcyon are the Byzantines. I'm sure that metaphor makes the history nerd's eyes twitch, but that seems to be the best explanation for why the city was named that beyond 
I don't know, it sounds kind of rich. Byzantium is a haven for the elite in Halcyon, because, of course, you can't have an exploitative capitalist system in a story without exploiters being present somewhere. The luxure of the city is an obvious facade, but there is still an air of classism and high culture snobbery. There are a lot of comparisons made between Byzantium and the actual city of New Vegas. Both are goals for the player, Byzantium more esoterically due to not being able to see it in the distance, or not being in the title. However, unlike New Vegas, Byzantium is not really a content hub. Outer Worlds relies on having these smaller world segments dividing up content, so when you arrive it isn't unfair to think that the city is going to be comparable in length to Edgewater and Monarch, but in a more urban-focused environment. It's probably even more surprising to learn just how close you are to the ending when you first arrive. Especially if we assume most players side with Phineas in the first playthrough. In the Noclip documentary on Outer Worlds, it's discussed that there were cuts to the main quest early in development, but also a great deal of talk about focus on design being on replayability, rather than making a 100 hour RPG. I only replayed Outer Worlds because it had been 8 months between my first playthrough and starting to write the script. I was not looking forward to a second playthrough during or after my first. If I didn't have this channel, I probably wouldn't have even completed the first playthrough, let alone gone for a second. Do not mistake my second playthrough as some sign of quality, in reality it's because I had easily forgotten most of the game. Given how bare bones the fan wikis are for this game, I think it's a fair wager that replayability was less a design goal and more of a design fantasy. Of course, this was the same documentary that also claimed the humor was necessary because the subject material was too dark. The secret is human corpses. Right. We'll see how necessary the humor is for the game when we get to Gorgon, but I think the barren nature of Byzantium makes the effort in the Veil all the more worse. Terra 2 was supposed to be an interconnected planet, hence why there is promotional art showing Byzantium off in the distance. But because Byzantium is in its own area, complete with a special nav key just like Roseway and Stellar Bay, it sets an expectation that it can't meet. And, well, it should be pretty obvious with how the game has been written up to this point that Byzantium is going to be more of the same. So if the humor in writing was better, it would also be great if Byzantium was a complete section. But the devs are right that I am thankful that the last act is so short, just not for the reason that they think. Should we arrive here from the Groundbreaker, then our objective is to meet with the adjutant of the chairman of the board, Sophia Akande. She serves the same role as Phineas for the board side. Or if you're like me, you can use her landing pad and then proceed to awkwardly avoid her and take the elevator, so I can go do a couple quests in the city to get my hands on a hat that boosts my perception. It was a waste of time anyways, since there's a free perception hat very early in the DLC. There is an interesting dynamic to the board. Chairman Rockwell is characterized as being an absent moron, while Akande is effectively running board operations in Halcyon. She is a patiently ruthless woman, but since she's working for the bad guys, she has to be critically unintelligent wherever necessary to facilitate the plot. She will call you if you dodge her up to a point on Phineas' side of the questline, but if you approach her first, then she'll want a trial period to verify our capabilities and intentions. Our first task is to assassinate a local cartographer. Apparently, she will tell us that Akande wanted Edgewater literally erased from the map, which I never saw that dialogue. It's interesting because it's setting up a future plot point on the board line. Seems like that's kind of important information for me to be reading about on Fexture Life. You can spare the cartographer if your conscience is an issue. All you'll lose is money. The dynamic, I believe, is that greedy, money-minded players are going to be drawn to the board side. It makes sense, I guess. I mean, no, it kind of doesn't. Outer Worlds has such a lack of stakes or consistency with value that it's hard to really roleplay as the greedy man. And it's not like there's a cool property or ship upgrades or even really interesting combat upgrades for me to spend the hundreds of thousands of bits I've made in this game on. Now, both my characters were basically trying to reform Halcyon and just had different approaches to doing it. What's wrong here is that while Rockwell is a greedy billionaire archetype, Akande is not. Her game plan doesn't seem to be self-enrichment, considering how much money she wastes or leaves sitting out on the table. She is written similarly to how a character who is ideologically motivated in their faction is written, but the board has no underlying ideology. There's no given reason for her to be so closed-minded in her operations. I say this because her next big unique quest is really stupid. We meet with Wells, plant a beacon on his station, if you side with him you can plant a corrupted beacon to buy him time. 
It is interesting that you can play both sides like this, and good that the game interweaves these events to make sure that either way we get to meet Wells at some point. Then we go do the board side of Monarch, which is the same exact quest, but just to shut down MSI and the Iconoclast broadcast so that they don't subvert the rest of the system. And then... And... And... And then... Adjutant Sophia Akande wants us to go take Edgewater off the map. My pleasure. But, well, this is a common breaking point for the board plotline, so let's back this up a step. Akande shows us a recording of the chairman revealing an issue to the colony. We get exposed to this on the other side after we break into his office for Wells. This is a real deal cutscene, establishing the central conflict that will be for the remainder of the game. This is supposed to justify the board's actions and radicalize Dr. Wells further to complete his mission to revive the Hope's colonists. Everyone will slowly stop living from malnutrition. But we're doing it together, and that's what matters. I swear, if someone doesn't give me something to read that will placate the masses soon, all of you will find yourselves violently unemployed. I don't even mind that it has comedic outtakes included. In fact, I like that Chairman Rockwell is having such difficulty with trying to spin the imminent crisis in any kind of positive light. But the crisis is that the colony is going to starve, or, um, or the food is, is not nutritious enough. We're all going to die of, uh, like, scurvy? Or No, I, I think it's scarcity, because they're going to stockpile the remaining food, put the workers in the stasis, and have Byzantium survive on rations, which would be... that would be calories. But then why were the people in Edgewater suffering from weakened immune systems? Why was Dr. Chartrand trying to modify humans to get nutrition from Halcyon species? It's, it's gotta be vitamin deficiencies. The idea is further stated that this has been happening for some time and that people are going to begin to invisibly starve as the food they're eating will stop doing anything. There is no such thing as an invisible food crisis. Whether the issue is calories or vitamins, the signs are always obvious, especially to anyone who's educated. Dr. Wells should not be surprised at this revelation, but he has to be, because there wouldn't be any valid reason for him to keep the issue a secret from us. And it has to be kept a secret from us for some reason, especially since that might inform our decisions when it comes to keeping certain scientists alive up to this point. So he has to not know. He has to not know because we have to wait for the cutscene to tell us. Why did this have to be a third act reveal? Imagine a version of New Vegas where you don't find out about the Hoover Dam in the intro cutscene, but only after you talk to Mr. House. Of course that's stupid. You get told up front what the issue is, and that informs a lot of quests hours before you even reach the Colorado River. The central conflict in New Vegas is power, both literally and metaphorically. Halcyon is under another resource conflict for something even baser, food, and it gets treated like a mystery. But really, the story doesn't feel like there's a missing element that we're dying to have revealed. It feels as though it's just meandering and giving the occasional lame take about capitalism. A contributing factor is that in most modern AAA games, it is very believable that a game would lack a central theme and just be lame takes all throughout. Also, guys, I, I, know, I know I said it's a third act reveal. That doesn't mean you should only have a third of your audience remaining at this point. When we were leaving Emerald Vale, Wells had mentioned food being a systems-wide issue, among other things. The lack of food and supplies seemed like a symptom of an overarching issue with greed. Turns out the board was operating this way intentionally in order to deal with a legitimate problem. Their plan is... it's stupid, but they have a plan. The reason the board isn't trying to awaken the Hope colonists is because it doesn't want to dump tens of thousands of new mouths to feed onto an already starving system. Dr. Wells is convinced that the people aboard are useful, but he's also insisted on seeming to want to awaken everybody, because he doesn't know about the central conflict. Once he finds out, it seems like the first thing we would try to establish is that Wells should be allowed to awaken some colonists, specifically people who are more specialized in biology, chemistry, and nutritional science. The board scientists are set up as being jokes, getting awards for making a product that is a fraction of a percent better. Diet Toothpaste was a secret, illegal project. But Akande is also stubborn. She has no interest in Adelaide's discovery, not because it requires corpses to make fertilizer, but because her mentality of being independent of the corporations is subversive. Edgewater broke the game's introduction, and it's going to break the game's main story. You cannot compromise on wiping out Edgewater. No secret evacuations in the night, no falsified reports, and not even really consequences. 
For example, Parvati will take issue with us killing Reed Thompson and need a skill check to stay on our crew, but we can wipe out Edgewater without any objection from her. Any thoughts? I could probably spend years fixing this boat, stem to stern. That's what pussy does to a mother. Okay, so Parvati and Felix can object to this, but only if they're present when we get our assignment from Akande. They can know about and participate fully in the plot to murder an entire town. It's only if they have to talk to Sophia Akande that they'll raise an objection with you. This is the biggest Bethesda moment of the game. I figured the designers didn't make the anti-board crew members more furious with us just because of the inflexibility of the quest. As in, it would be pretty rough to penalize players harshly for a quest that has only one resolution. Foundation only happens on the board side of the quest line. Wells has no equivalent moment sending us back to Edgewater. I don't know, maybe Wells could have us recruit Adelaide or get her research if she had died. Maybe we should try to get her research independent of which side that we are doing. So it seems like if you didn't have the time to flesh this quest out, it'd be better to just cut the entire thing. I mean, this is a big deal in the story. Let's run with the assumption that this was left in in order to serve as characterization for Sophia. Why does she want this to happen this badly? Earlier in the game, you can find out that the Edgewater Geothermal Plant's auto-mechanicals had their targeting parameters set to humans in order to exterminate the plant workers, in order to cut down on payroll. Akande actually commends this action and says that the person responsible was promoted for lateral thinking, but why? If you have resource scarcity and have committed to putting workers in stasis with rotating schedules to bring them out, why not just commit a little bit of population downsizing at that point? Look, either a character is into genocide or they're not. One does not get to ride that line without any acknowledgement, and if they are, we really should get some insights into what they're thinking. There is a very similar character who serves as antagonist of the Firefly film Serenity. I, I see no listing of rank or, or name. I have neither. Like this facility, I don't exist. Even just his name is characterization. He's called the operative because he doesn't need a name. He's a tool of the state and he believes 100% that what he is doing, no matter how reprehensible, is for the greater good. Even if he won't be allowed to live in the society that he's creating. He is a perfect foil to Captain Reynolds' sense of individual freedom and morality. I'm unarmed. Good. <laughs> In his mission to stop Reynolds and reclaim an asset for the Alliance, the operative wipes out every location Reynolds has hidden in in the past. That was not a forced narrative event. It is a logical outcome to a series of scenes preceding that point in the movie. He has an ideological conviction because the Alliance as a faction is more than just a syndicate of greedy corporations. Conviction is where they are similar, but Akande is different because she gets to be a policymaker as well as enforcer. She wants to deal with the food crisis and she's doing that by increasing the power of the central government. Cool. Got it. That could very easily happen in the real world. I like that Halcyon was so decentralized and corporatist that it basically did the backdoor route to communism. Centralized government that owns all the businesses and now we're doing the secret police purging and mass starvation stuff. But Akande is stubborn about accepting Adelaide's solution. I mean, the whole situation is pretty dumb. If fertilizer is all it takes to grow crops that reduce vitamin deficiencies, then congratulations! There are dozens of ways to acquire fertilizer. Bodies are just the low-tech option. Of course, that's assuming Adelaide was using fertilizer to grow earth food, not halcyon food. But they also have just regular chickens. It's weird that this and Fallout 76 are both games that focus on mutated or alien creatures, but they also just have normal chickens. Do you see what I mean with the food crisis? It doesn't really track because in a technological society, it's an extremely solvable problem. You can chemically synthesize fertilizer, vitamins, even food. Granted, synthetic foods actually coming to market happened after the release of this game, but we had the technology. If you have the equipment and the mandate, which the board has both, this should not be an issue. This is a system where GMOs are a core tech. I really think the idea the game is supposed to be pitching is that the corporations rushed in too quickly, didn't test the long-term effects the local food would have on people, decided against just transplanting a bunch of Earth species, and are now paying the price. I'm sorry, but that's too colossally stupid for me not to just decide to go back to Earth, and not in a believable way. 
Cheaping out on food is something they might absolutely do, but this is severely impacting the upper class of Halcyon as well. Speaking of though, our first objective for Wells to find the chemicals is to meet with the Earth Minister Clark. He's living under house arrest because, as it turns out, the board lost contact with Earth and kind of don't want the Earth Minister to know that. That at least makes some sense, because the easiest solution would have been to just buy Earth food and have it shipped in. But there are other systems as well, at least they are alluded to during the world building for the Groundbreaker. They can't abide an independent township, especially not one they gotta depend on. We're the first and last stop out of this colony. All their interstellar freighters come through us, and we skim a few bits off the top and manifest processing fees with every one. Folks around here will bluster that the board hates our freedom, but really, they know we can stop their out-system shipments anytime we like, and that terrifies them. What the fuck? Ultimately, I can't really invest myself in a plot that thinks its central issue is either a joke or severely misunderstands how any of this would work. And it's even further frustrating to be pitted against relentlessly stubborn characters who will take 90% of the steps they need to in order to succeed, but fail at the last couple. If the food crisis is real... <laughs> yeah, you don't want your audience saying things like that about your main plot. If the food crisis is real, Dr. Wells' plan won't work. Halcyon is about to have an imminent case of famine. Without a central government like the board, the prudent thing to do would be to take over Emerald Vale, try to poach as many good people as you can and use the bountiful number of fresh corpses that will be created as a stopgap to try and start an agricultural economy on Terra 2. The board should be a decent option, but it's not. Akande doesn't budge on accepting Adelaide's solution, but chastises us for stealing the diet toothpaste research that was going to be necessary because they were going to trick people into thinking that they weren't hungry. That works until people's babies start dying of malnutrition, which actually should already be happening. The worst part is that if you take over the board at the end, your character will still enact the original plan, meaning that it's not like we can throw in with the board hoping that they can be convinced by our big brain to do an actually reasonable plan. Like the other dilemmas we've been presented with, the writers have made sure to let us know that all options are miserable, and that it's really comfortable up here on this fence. Of course, there is actually a best third option. Both lines intersect here. Wells wants us to skip the hope to Terra 2, while Akande wants the hope taken to Tartarus, a prison world. Again, the conflict boils down to there being only one MacGuffin to share. Boarding the hope is one of the surprisingly easiest sequences in the game. The UDL is now guarding the ship, but thanks to our holographic shroud, you can just walk through the entire ship without any issue. Yeah, so. Phineas gave us the shroud as an espionage tool. If you can get your hands on an ID cartridge, you can sneak through areas. You have a limited time window that's affected by movement, so you are free to stop and plan your movements. All of these shroud sections are extremely forgiving, especially if you're invested into speech skills. It is nice that you aren't thrown into combat as soon as you're detected, but it's way too easy to talk your way through an entire stealth section with ease. I would probably cut down on the shroud timer, but put a stop to it when you're crouched. Basically, you can crouch walk through an area, but if a guard sees you crouched walking around, even in uniform, he'll get suspicious, so you can use your limited charge to then walk through guard sightlines. The upside here is that it encourages usage of the actual stealth skill outside of sniper builds, and rewards actually being good at stealth. Another one of those good ideas that didn't get the time that it deserved. There's a bit of a story to the Hope, explaining what exactly had happened. The Groundbreaker and Hope were sent at the same time, with the travel time being 10 years. Only in the ninth year, the Hope's drive failed and it came out of FTL. It was going to take them 26 years to complete the journey, with one year's worth of rations left. You can see where this is going. They tried to grow some food, but that did not work, and some of the crew began to cannibalize colonists to survive. The only problem was that to survive the full period, tens of thousands would need to be eaten. Now, I have to applaud Obsidian for writing a textual story in an environment which actually has something to do with anything related to the central theme of the game. Oh, hey, Fallout 76. When the Hope crew is incompetent at surviving without food, that makes a lot of sense. I've tried to grow potatoes before, but it didn't work because my brain is a chicken breast. So I don't have much of an issue with this crew having a small difficulty figuring out how to do it in less than a year. We're then presented with the choice whether to give the hope to Phineas or Akande. And I choose to feed the ship to the sun.
Honestly though, for real, that's definitely the game's best ending. Deprive everyone of the ability to enact their bad ideas. Dumb choices were something that Obsidian leaned into following New Vegas, where new dialogue is unlocked by having minimum intelligence. So I have to commend them for giving the playstyle its own ending. Alright, praise is over, let's get into the actual ending that players saw. Depending on where you sent the hope, the opposite faction rep will get kidnapped by the other and taken to Tartarus. Convenient. We either have to assault the prison or fight through a prison riot. Factions you assisted previously will arrive to provide aid, these being the Iconoclasts, MSI, and the Mardettes. Remember them? The, you know, you know, the people aboard the Groundbreaker. Why are any of you guys here? Honestly, I don't even need the help. I can stealth and speedrun my way past the entire encounter. More people than necessary are dying because I did you guys favors. I do enjoy when games let you pay off past quests in the finale, but this is obviously kinda rushed. Should Rockwell die, which, well, I didn't see him on my way here, that just leaves Wells and Akande. Rockwell is just Akande's replacement should you kill her anyways. There are some tricky skill checks here, which were actually changed by the DLC. I believe the thought process is that, due to the 6 extra levels offered by the DLC, it's more reasonable to expect these increased skill values should you be max level in this final encounter. Outer Worlds ends with a slideshow explaining all the different outcomes of the various quests we completed, which can obviously take a while depending on how much side content you did. The ending slides aren't very fun, mostly because this is where the game is judging the player for our deeds, but is also establishing hard outcomes. For example, generally speaking, Phineas's ending is more positive, while the board's ending is more negative. That's not hard to predict. It's just disappointing that this game opted for a binary morality. Ultimately though, it's just a condensed form of everything wrong with the game that we've discussed. It has trouble with its humor, its world building, and providing good choices. Ultimately, The Outer Worlds feels like an official imitation of Fallout New Vegas. It has seen the form, function, and most importantly, popularity of that game, and so has striven to recreate it, no matter how inauthentic that is. The reason I've had such difficulty writing the script is that ultimately, I just want the game to be put out of its misery, which is where the DLC comes in. From the furthest reaches of the universe comes the biggest mystery in the galaxy. An abandoned research facility, and now shady corporate intrigue. Marvel of the Gorgon Asteroid. A sordid stopover, full of salacious secrets and scandalous strangers. Peril on Gorgon is surprisingly good. In a game that I was either zoned out or hated playing, I was very much surprised by this DLC. I had started the second DLC on my first character because it appears first and had not gotten very far in before I quit playing entirely. I was fully expecting another struggle session from Gorgon when I was pleasantly surprised. Also, for the record, I played Gorgon last the second time around as well, but we're going to talk about it first. So that's why I have weapons from Eridanos, for the, you know, three fans who notice. It's just really weird that Obsidian constantly releases the DLC in confusing orders, where the later DLC gets presented first. That said, I am glad I ended things with Gorgon and not Eridanos. It's kind of like ending Morrowind with Blood Moon, except Blood Moon was actually the last expansion. There are a lot of times where I can suss out the true potential of games I cover. Outer Worlds struggled greatly at that for me, but it was Peril on Gorgon that really made me think that Obsidian could have made this a good game had it just been made more like this. Of course, being the DLC, it's able to be a response to some of the criticism the original game had gotten. The main thing to note is that the awkward humor has been toned down significantly. Most of the jokes actually landed, and the humor did not get in the way of dramatic storytelling. The world building is also logical, it ties into a major component of the original game and tells a compelling story with it to the point that I wish Peril's story was the main plot, even if that would have been blatantly a ripoff of Serenity. The sequence was also mechanically compelling, as in, the world design actually functioned to create interesting environments both visually and in terms of exploration and combat. Dare I say, Peril on Gorgon is actually great. The greatest proof though is that I spent days struggling to write through the ending for Outer Worlds, but discussion on Gorgon just flows onto the page with renewed enthusiasm. If I had abandoned this project in 2022, I would have played everything in Outer Worlds except for the part that I ended up liking, and I would have walked away from the early part of Murder on Eridanos assuming that both of the DLC was just more nonsense. 
When I was telling people about Peril, they seemed surprised at what I was saying, so I think this is a pretty common view on this game. And the reason why was as obvious as the answer to the question, so how do I play it? Which is that you need to make main quest progress in the Outer Worlds. It's hard to recommend this DLC simply for that reason. To unlock Peril, you have to complete Radio Free Monarch. You know, that achievement only 41% of Outer Worlds players have. That one you get after Emerald Vale, as well as Monarch. We'll receive a corpse in the mail containing an audio recording asking for help. Well, that was the Firefly version of this plot. We only received the hand. Before you think some of these could be coincidences, it is important to remember Firefly only had 14 episodes and a movie. It's not like it did everything by merit of just being a long-running show with tons of seasons. I like scenes where the crew is sitting at a dinner table discussing things, and it really makes me wish they had done more like this with the base game. We make our way to Ambrose Manor to take up the job that this man had lost his hand over. We were not expecting company. Please follow. Do not stray from the path. Aw, oh, that's no fun. I like that the manor and Gorgon are in each other's skybox. Gorgon looms over the Ambroses while our new employer is watching us from above. Wilhelmina Ambrose speaks like a person who grew up with wealth, but not in the typical, Oh, I simply cannot believe we do not charge the poors to breathe, as would be typical for Outer Worlds. The job is straightforward. Her mother was the head of research on Gorgon, and we need to recover her journal. I may have over-prepared for the mission. Almost everything seemed to indicate that it was going to be dangerous as soon as we landed, but turns out there is already a sliver of civilization at the dock being run by Sublight. I was actually hoping that Gorgon was going to be a continuous mission where the crew would get pushed to their limits. Still, it's not bad, just, you know, familiar if you've seen the film Serenity. Serenity centers around a secret that the ship's psychic crew member had learned during her stint being experimented on. When the Firefly crew had their options taken from them, Reynolds makes the literal executive <laughs> decision to undergo an extremely dangerous mission to visit a planet deep in Reaver territory. So, the Reavers were this mysterious force of savage men. Firefly did a good job setting up their threat as well as making people curious what exactly they were. Gorgon and the Marauders is a repeat of Miranda and the Reavers. Only we don't have to make a daring trip through Marauder space to reach Gorgon, but Peril also spends more time on this plotline. Similarly, Miranda was about how the Reavers were made, and Gorgon is about how the Marauders were made. But Peril focuses more on the specifics, while Serenity didn't have as much time for that. It is a smart distinction to make. It's pretty obvious up front that Spacer's Choice made the Marauders with Adrena time. The DLC does not even try to pretend that that is a mystery. We're more so figuring out how it went wrong, rather than what went wrong. We are gradually unpeeling layers to the facility, and it is pretty unsettling. For instance, a woman wants us to find her husband who wasn't able to evacuate with her. We do, well, specifically we find his journal, which includes an account of the gradual transformation he had into becoming a marauder. Even though he didn't have a substance problem, he needed the drug to stay awake long enough to keep guard, which saw him eventually becoming a marauder. And the best part is that neither Felix nor Ellie interrupt to say at least he didn't live a substanceless life. Eh? Get it? I can't say it enough. The companions reprised their roles and got to participate in the story more seriously. The only disappointment I did have was that Nyoka didn't seem to have any lines to acknowledge the unique monsters on Gorgon. There are also occasions where you have to leave the planet and go to other places in the system. This is so that we can catch up with some of these surviving researchers. I don't really know if this adds a whole lot to the story. Of course, we have to leave so that we can get boarded by mercenaries trying to shut us down or, well, attempted boarding. It gets reversed and ends badly for them. Like, it's a funny sequence. It's actually trying to space out the big revelations with something more lighthearted. And it's not just a quip that sabotages a serious moment, but an actually funny sequence about a sports team turned space pirates. And then we get to the serious moments. What had happened was that Spacer's Choice conceptualized the product of Adrena Time and what it was going to be capable of, and then tasked the research team to create the drug from there. 
That was obviously backwards and created a ton of issues, namely that they needed a ton of research subjects due to just how many different effects the drug was supposed to have. Each department had issues with bad expectations which led to a horrible feedback loop that increasingly broke things down. There wasn't a part of this entire project that had good motivations because everyone was stuck inside the misery machine. Spacers wanted the drug to change people, to make them even more effective workers, to squeeze even more productivity out of their own people. On Miranda, the Alliance had messed with the atmosphere using the existing terraformers. The aim was to reduce human aggression, but they accidentally gave the entire population a lethal case of lethargy. Well, except for a tiny percentage who became more aggressive. The Reavers were punishment for the Alliance's hubris of trying to control human behavior. So, you know, kinda similar. Our first task is to gain full access to the full facility. Once we have that, we can really start getting into the awful things that happened here. The best part of Gorgon for me was playing it on Supernova, because you have to continually retreat to sell stuff and sleep. Honestly, the pay from the job was significantly less than the money I made from salvaging gear. It also really seemed like a sequence where having Supernova on actually enhances the experience. Beating the game on Supernova was pretty much just motivated by me wanting to say that I had done it on my YouTube channel, as between the Veil and Gorgon it's almost completely imperceptible. But on Gorgon, Supernova actually accentuates the gameplay. It's just a shame that again you have to play Outer Worlds on Supernova to experience it. A lot of the storytelling is done through terminals and somewhat uncommonly a few audio logs. These are actually surprisingly well done and I read all of them, even the redundant ones, because yeah, an email will exist in the recipient and the sender's accounts. It really made Gorgon feel like a big, interconnected facility of conflicting departments. I think the key detail is that the written text doesn't waste time or information, and does not feel out of place with the level design. It's not thrown in haphazardly, but in important offices either at the beginning or end of an area, so that it doesn't feel like a massive disruption of the game's flow to stop and read for a bit. Each step in the Gorgon main questline gets worse and worse. It starts typical, bad working conditions, a hasty evacuation that got people killed, corporations killing their own employees, nothing new, I've played Outer Worlds. And then we find the conditions the research subjects were living in and being experimented upon in. The most sobering part being disposals, which were so common because Spacers wasn't happy with any of the produced compounds. This isn't just a bleak message about Spacer's Choice executives being casually cruel. Everyone involved lost their humanity. The prisoners that were subjected to this and turned into mute cubes when they died. The researchers who had to live with the constant human death becoming numb to it. When you say you need humor to space out dark subject material, this is about where I would expect you to be operating at. Like, it's not the worst thing I've seen in sci-fi, but it's appropriately horrible. A good balance between being too tame and too edgy. Moreover, it does a lot for a group of generic raider types that the game had. I mean, back in Edgewater, there was some allusion to the relationship between Adrena Time and Marauders, and Marauders being generally wild and aggressive, and my thought at the time was pretty much just that it was a convenient excuse to have nameless bandits for the player to kill in between objectives. The least I can say is that it made me feel just a little bad for farming marauders. Not a lot, only a little, but that kind of speaks to Gorgon's strength that it could move my black heart. Not all the marauders are test subjects, and it would be interesting to know the pipeline of how this epidemic is working. For example, is the board concerned about Adrena time addiction? Do they allow it to happen so that the population downsizes? Spacers is owned by the UDL who used the board as a puppet government, so Gorgon being exposed could be a problem, but you would also think the UDL would be working harder to clamp down on Adrena time to cover it up, or that they actually wouldn't care because there's nobody to punish the UDL anyways. Miranda was a big deal for the Alliance, if only because it would undermine their future attempts at correcting human behavior. But the Alliance also didn't have as strong of a stranglehold on the local population as the board does in Halcyon. I mean, there was a civil war in the verse not long before Miranda got exposed, so I'm sure the old rebels didn't take the news particularly well. Wilhelmina's mother, Olivia, is a character. She gets a lot of unfavorable characterization when reading at the lower levels, and a lot of stuff that definitely makes it seem like she was just a reckless manager. But you get more and more context that really gives you grounds to understand the pressure that she had been operating under. 
She's also trying to keep the project dead and to let the Marauders live in relative peace. She's an actually complex premise for a character that you are allowed to judge on your own and make a decision regarding later in the story. I know, what a novelty. Olivia does try to pretend that she isn't the mysterious voice, even though the only twist bigger than it being her would be if it wasn't. We ended up coming across the Pam bot, which is like Sam but focused on worker productivity. If you follow the general rule of bringing Sam to discussions with robots, then you get treated to an amusing dialogue of Sam recharging her batteries. Greetings, Pam. Don't get swept away by the sleaze of your filthy, worthless existence. Let Sam neaten up your life. Work fortifies the spirit. Let Pam optimize the routines of your life for maximum productivity. Sam units. If we can't clean it, we'll destroy it beyond recognition. All Pam units have been programmed to encourage a worker's competitive spirit. Well done. Continue destroying the competition on behalf of Spacer's Choice. Got a lust for dust? Sam does. Pam believes in the power of a well-organized spreadsheet. Cleanliness is next to lawfulness. I can almost believe that they've made some sort of deep connection that bypasses reason completely. Nobody tell Ada. What's nice too is that only two of the six companions can help us with this, and doing so sends in Pam forward to clear out a couple marauders. For a brief moment, it's almost like I'm playing New Vegas again. Towards the end of this final facility, we've gotten our hands on our objective, the journal. But it's pretty obvious at this point in the storyline that the situation's a bit more complex than simply giving Minnie the journal back so she can kick up the Adrena Time Project again. You can agree that Project Gorgon is best left buried, give Minnie the keys to try and likely fail again, or go through a rather tricky process to reconcile Olivia and her daughter into working together to try and cure Adrena Time addiction. Now, it's not amazing, but for a DLC, it does a lot of things right, and it accomplishes those goals by not falling into the same pitfalls that Outer Worlds had suffered. Which raises a good question. Why weren't the problems more obvious in development? Sadly, the answer is not that Obsidian just learned, because we still haven't been to Eridanos. There is an odd quest randomly in the middle of Gorgon with some lost mercenaries arguing over what a llama is supposed to look like. So whatever corruptive influences at Obsidian didn't get silenced, just restrained for this one DLC. So in other words, Peril on Gorgon is not a guarantee that Outer Worlds 2 won't have the same exact problems. In fact, if anything, the trailer indicates that they will absolutely repeat the issues that the first game had. On the Outer Worlds of the Outer Worlds, there's a place that's full of cheer. Murder on Eridanus was the second and final piece of Outer Worlds content, at least until The Outer Worlds 2. The premise of this DLC is that an actress was murdered. We get a nice cutscene to see it, well, not literally, the circumstances of her murder are completely different. So film people, why does this cutscene look so good during the black and white part, but when it's in the color it just looks so, you know, like a video game? Anyways, we get a call on account of pretending to be Captain Hawthorne as the Grand Colonial Hotel wants to hire an outside investigator to solve the mystery of Halcyon Helen's death. Now look, I get complaining this early might seem unusual. When you play it, you don't immediately think something minor is a sign of things to come. It's in retrospect when you're able to pay more attention to events that you realize that it all starts from the outset. It's very pulpy that we've been hired to handle this investigation. That's intentional, since both DLCs seem to market themselves as being semi-serialized fiction, but it's more obvious with murder that we really should not be here. Eridanos is a floating facility in the upper atmosphere of a gas giant, which I have to say is pretty cool. Outer Worlds was generally lower tech to sell a western vibe, but that means that most everything shown was fairly simple. I did find the size of planets in the skybox to be very distracting, and the planetary rings aren't really special if everything has to have them. The Grand Colonial is pretty good though. It makes a lot more sense that rich people would vacation here instead of a sublight base on Monarch. The world building for murder is good, which is why you don't hear me asking questions about the atmosphere. If Peril was addressing the game's tonal problems, then Murder's working harder on its world building. It is a shame that there wasn't a third DLC to make an extremely choice-heavy story. 
Eridanos does bring a return to large amounts of humor, but it's still better balanced than the base game. It keeps the comedy and drama separate, but still sets up a ton of decent punchlines. The dynamic of the hotel also works really well. You have the facility admin, the constable, and the guy running sublight in the area. The contracts are convoluted, and everyone hates everyone else, meaning that they need us, an outsider, to investigate the murder as everybody here has a bias. Especially since Rizzo's, the hotel's owner, was about to have Halcyon Helen unveil their new alcoholic product line. That there was a high-profile murder at the hotel when so much money was on the line has frayed relations significantly. Now of course, you know I love murder investigations. That said, the first weak point mechanically is that the game relies on a gadget called the discrepancy amplifier. It's a magnifying glass that sounds off whenever it detects something of interest to the investigation nearby. Problem one is the voice is annoying. Hector Andor, unauthorized arsonist. This unit has detected a discrepancy related to Halcyon Helen. Unscheduled expiration of. Begin amplification. It sounds like how I would say it if I was making a parody of the game. The other problem is that it makes it too easy to notice details because all you have to do is be near them. It's making an assumption about both the player but also the scope of what the writers are able to accomplish. This is an investigation where the player can perform either fully or conclude it quickly. Basically, whether or not you can correctly deduce the killer is dependent on how much attention that you pay. So, having the discrepancy amplifier is unnecessary because it's easy to come to the wrong conclusion. Or maybe, it's too easy to come to the right one. There's a key piece of evidence to figure out who the murderer is, which I actually missed. But, I did not need it to figure out that the administrator was the murderer. There were two main reasons that I deduced this. The first was in-universe, which is that of the investigation I did, nobody seemed fully guilty. The other was an out-of-universe reason, which is that you never actually meet the administrator in person. Hmm, I wonder if the only person I can't kill up to this point is actually the murder suspect. Plus, I was just shooting my shot because I hadn't gotten the chance to actually interview him and turns out I was right. It was the administrator. Oh, uh, okay. It's a bit disappointing. Doing the investigation properly is interesting, so to have it end this way just feels like one final kick to the teeth and an on-brand waste of my time for this game. The evidence that you are actually supposed to use against Ludovico is that the constable had discovered her own evidence against the administrator right before dying of a heart attack. Which I think is pretty disappointing, but I guess it was an effective red herring. I had actually thought to check in with the constable early on, but I had no clue where to find her because her office is located in the sublight facility, and even then, it just seems weak to just have a concrete piece of evidence exist in a corner of the map when so much of the investigation is so expertly interwoven. There are several suspects you need to investigate, and it creates this convoluted relationship web of seemingly contradictory events. If you believe everything, then Helen has this insane journey across the entire Eridanos platform, including multiple instances of almost being murdered before the final time where it's stuck. She got minor poisoning from a competing actor, Spencer Woolrick. The Burbage unit, a robot actor, was armed with a plasma cannon. A local guru of profit thought she accidentally killed her and dragged her body out into the wilds before she managed to wake back up. Her boyfriend was distraught after a breakup and alarmingly doesn't remember much due to repetitive brain injuries from playing tossball. The head of Sublight is the most likely suspect, being a known criminal, but has the least motivation as he only finds a reason to kill her after she's dead. However, there's one key detail to all of this. Murder on Eridanos is Outer Worlds DLC, meaning that the forces which inevitably wear down your spirit when playing this game have to be considered. Peril on Gorgon has the same problem, but Peril is also less reliant on the player actually paying attention to details. I have to commend the game for actually requiring investigative work. The big twist also isn't that Ludovico did it, but that Helen is actually still alive. Yeah, during the investigation, there's a mysterious agent we're working against that's revealed to be a related woman halfway through leading to a final decision. Hey, isn't this just like Peril on Gorgon? Halcyon Helen was secretly two women, twin sisters, Ruth and Belinda Bellamy. It is convenient that the known name of the actress also happened to be the sister that got killed, while the other sister, the one who moonlit as an actual investigator, managed to survive. Another problem that ultimately invalidates the investigation, however, is that your accusation does not matter. Whomever you accuse, Bellamy will break into the facility Ludovico is in, prompting us to the next quest. 
The rest of Murder on Eridanos is a standard plotline where a corporation is doing something evil to modify human behavior. They're putting brain slugs in the alcohol to turn the colonists gay. As in, no, like literally, as in happy. So the question is, why? Does the DLC think the murder investigation is a joke, and the brain slug plot is the real deal? Was there a mandate that the DLC still had to tie back into the anti-corporate themes? Did the ever-elusive management take all their time away? Look, I'm not going to go in depth on a plotline in this game about corporations trying to put brain slugs into everyone's water so that they're more happy and thus ignore the hunger pangs. I don't know why you decided that that was going to be the final message of Outer Worlds, and that's probably why it was decided that murder was going to be offered to players first, because players don't think too much about doing things in release order compared to the order the content gets presented in. That said, ending this game with a duel against the giant brain slug queen and then a couple awkward conversations is really only fitting. No amount of wasted potential in a murder investigation is going to ever cover up that lack of payoff. It is funny that my favorite weapon in the game ended up being the final thing you get from Outer Worlds, and fortunately I played Gorgon second so I actually got to use it. Helen's weapon, the Needler, is a science weapon that rotates between three different effects. You can sap armor, do damage over time, and reduce the speed of the target. The effects are rotated using the reload, meaning you have to actively manage it. The reason I like the Needler so much is because my character was entirely incapable of fighting alone, but with it I actually got to play a support role. Science weapons were interesting. Rather than being direct damage effects, they have effects which can be comboed to do damage. Stuff like the Shrink Ray or the Gloop Gun that applies an anti-gravity ragdoll effect. Science weapons also scale with the science skill, giving another way to build your character. I tried to do this my final run and found myself kind of disappointed, especially since most of the better science weapons are in the DLC. I did not run the Prismatic Hammer, but my goal was to have interesting weapons, not high damage ones. The Outer Worlds was a game that I dreaded writing about. It is a fan favorite game that has missing articles on NPCs, bare bones documentation, and very limited discussion. I didn't talk about the recent Spacer's Choice remaster, largely because that came out after I had finished playing and most of the way through writing the script. There isn't really much to say. It wasn't made by Obsidian, but rather by the publisher, Private Division, hence why it didn't get marketed by Microsoft. The remaster arguably does not look better. I know it's subjective, but many of the elements that caught my eye were for the wrong reasons. It just increased the performance issues and most bizarrely, uncapped the level cap to 99. This was a confusing decision. Even modders hadn't gone that high, simply because there isn't enough content to justify such a high level cap. Even playing comprehensively, I doubt you could surpass level 45. It's just a strange decision. All right, with that out of the way, I can conclude on this game. The funniest part of the DLC is still needing to complete the Tartarus sequence just to see the new end cards, meaning that not even the DLC can escape the shadow that is the broader game. Unless the holes in the mountain were made for you, I do not see how this game could be appealing. As in, literally every part of it has to be made for you aesthetically, or it will eventually fail. It is a funny contrast having written this video as a sister project to Fallout 76. My second run through saw me alternating playtimes with that bizarre project. If you didn't see that video, I would say that Fallout 76, the part that came out before Outer Worlds, had some interesting ideas that were sabotaged by it being a buggy mess at launch, leading to perception that its story wasn't very good. Outer Worlds has the opposite problem. Its story is not particularly interesting or experimental, but because it was contrast material with 76, it got viewed favorably at launch. It was going to be a real RPG to finally take Bethesda's throne, they got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity ticket with a new IP where the competition before, in 76, and after, in Cyberpunk 2077, dropped the ball so spectacularly that simply being present with a good idea could have been a ticket for success for Obsidian. Instead, they finally sold out.